thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, help us to be a people who, as that song reminds us, to, to kind of forget what was behind. As Paul says, to strain towards what is ahead and to press on uh, toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you for the, for the prize of, of knowing you, of all we've inherited in you, of, of you changing us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you see the works of your hands. You see where you want to take us. You, want to, you see the characters that you're shaping and molding and using all sorts of things in our lives to, to transform us into the image and likeness of Jesus. Help us to be pliable. Help us to be moldable. Help us to be teachable in those things, Lord. And Lord, as we look at your word now, I pray your blessing on Brian. Lord, I pray you just really anoint him this morning and help us to, to listen and to apply what it is you'd want us to do in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good to see you again. Let's uh, start with a short prayer. We're going to read it together, actually. Hopefully it's going to go on the screen. We're going to read the Lord's Prayer together. Familiar words. Hopefully all of you know it. But uh, if you need a prompt, it's on the screen for you now. Um, we've chosen a particular version. It might not be the perfect one or the one that you know really well. Uh, but go along with these words anyway. And we'll say it together as a, as a preface, really, and a continuation of where we've been so far this morning. So together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let me read to you some words uh, from Hebrews, uh, chapter 10. Uh, maybe it will be on the screen as well. I'm going to read to you an extract of a letter. It was a letter written to encourage people to keep on going. A letter to, keep to, to people to make sure they stayed on track with their faith and didn't start to revert to their old habits, basically. There was a conference of Christianity and Judaism, and, and uh, people in the Jewish faith were becoming Christians, and were carrying on, but had started to receive some persecution and were tempted to give up and go back to just what they knew, their old habits. It was fine. They'd started on this Jesus-following journey. They didn't quite like what it was leading to. It didn't quite like what it was meaning for them. And so they started to revert and regress backwards to say, do you know what? We're just going to stick to what we've always known. They didn't like change, and they were fearful of it, and they didn't always like what it was going to lead to, and they'd worked out what it meant for their lives. So these words, they are a part of a letter they're part of a long letter, and these particular words come at the end of a portion in the letter where the writer is trying to encourage and sum up everything about Jesus that is superior to anything that they've ever experienced, known or understood. So he's encouraging them to keep on going, and why should they keep on going? Because Jesus is who he claims to be and is vastly superior in work and, wo and word to anything that they'd experienced in their faith or walk as a human being before. And these are the words. We're just summing up the end of a long discourse. I'm starting in verse 5 of chapter 10. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, and it's in comparison to the Jewish uh, traditions in many ways, sacrifice and offering you didn't desire but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you weren't pleased. So I said, here I am. It's written about me in the scroll, the Old Testament, and I have come to do your will, my God. Well, first he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you didn't desire, nor were you pleased with them, even though they were offered in accordance with the law. And then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. And he sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, that's God's will, 
we, that's you and I, have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Going back, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties, and again and again he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds... Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. If you're an avid follower of politics, and maybe some of you are, but don't put your hand up if you are. If you're an avid follower of politics or of sport, you will have noticed in many times in recent weeks how many times the leader or the manager or the coach has set the tactics and they set the game plan, and they're intending that their followers should follow the game plan, execute the plan, in a desire to win whatever race or competition they're in. And sometimes that's been done with some success to some degree or another, and some less so. We won't go back to last Saturday for the Man City fans, just so you know, all right? But some people have been following well, and some people have not been following so well. I want us this morning to look at the greatest leader in history, the person who's had the greatest impact on human history, and what a leader he is and was, and how he impacts his followers, who was represented largely by people in this room and by people who follow him today and around and ever since, and ask ourselves, to what extent are we following the game plan, and how are we running the race that we've been set forth uh, by him? Jesus when he came and started to be able to understand the Old Testament, worked out pretty early in his life that God had a special plan and a special purpose for his life. God is a God of peace. And he wants peace with every single person and with every part of his creation. That includes you and me. But he also knows and understands that we cannot have peace with him because we do not follow the pattern that Jesus set out in his life. We do not give ourselves wholeheartedly to God. We all get into things that determine our own outcome for our own lives. Sin. Gets in the way, doesn't it? Creates enmity between us and God. Jesus realised that the purpose that God had for his life was that he was going to live a life that was going to lead to an outcome that enabled peace to happen through the reconciliation of God and man, through what Jesus did on the cross. And we celebrate that together in just a few minutes. So Jesus works out pretty early that he had a purpose and a plan from God. And he was absolutely determined, come what may, that he would see that plan and that purpose fulfilled in his life. And that everything he did, in every step of his life, set out to accomplish the purpose and the plan that God had for his life. So that one day, at whatever point God judged necessary or relevant, he would lay down his life, a perfect body and perfect blood, died on a cross as a sacrifice in our stead. And we celebrate that together in just a few minutes. Jesus became obedient. That was his whole outlook in life. Here I am, I have come to do your will, my God, is what he said, echoing the words of Psalm chapter 40. Read Psalm 31 a few minutes ago, didn't we? Psalm chapter 40. Here I am, I've come to do your will in the body that you've created for me. So when it comes to us as his followers, it kind of makes sense that we would imitate and copy what Jesus did. Jesus set out to be completely obedient in everything that he did. Thought, word, action. Where do you think the body of Christ is right now? Just look around. 
It's here, isn't it? Do you think if Jesus was in the body that he had before he went back to heaven, he would still be carrying on fulfilling everything that God wanted in his life? Yes, I do. Hopefully you do too. So what do you think he wants for his body that represents him now on earth as his hands and feet? That we too should fulfill everything that God has set out for us to do in our lives. That we should also be obedient, that we should tip up on a Sunday morning and on a Monday and a Tuesday morning, by the way, and say, here I am, I've come to do your will, O God. And when Jesus gave us the pattern of prayer, what are one of the first sentences and first lines and first phrases in that prayer that we all read together earlier on? Our Father, because he's our Father, Jesus and ours, you're in heaven, and what will should it be? Your will should be done, and where should it be done? On earth as it is in heaven. We are here to carry on the purposes of God in our life. And where do we learn about those purposes? Well, Jesus had learned about his in the Old Testament. He didn't have the New Testament. We get ours with the benefit of the New and the Old Testament. We get a general outline of the purpose for everybody's life in this room. You and I have different careers. We have different walks. We've got different skills. We've got different families. Some of us got curly hair. Some of us got no hair. Some of us have specs. Some of us no specs. But God has a plan and purpose for every single one of us in this room, as well as collectively as a body, generally across the world and throughout time, and this group of people in here in this generation. And it's our job to put ourselves in the same place as Jesus did when he, when we, when he responded to God. He said, you know what? You've given me a body. Here I am. I've come to do your will. God and Jesus want us to be obedient to that will. Now, I don't know about you, but being obedient ain't easy. It's a word that we don't like these days. We try and erase it from marriage vows as quickly as we possibly can. We try and get out of everything that we want to in life. Everything's got to be coached, respected, and that sort of stuff. But you know what? I wonder if we miss something if we just erase that from our lives. But God wants us to be obedient. But being obedient ain't easy either. Sometimes we don't want it to be there because it ain't easy. It's hard. Well, God knows this and there's good news because there's help at hand. Because God has given us the Holy Spirit. There's three things. There's the inner strength of the Holy Spirit working in us. And what does this passage tell us that the Holy Spirit's going to do for us? He is going to help us by writing in our minds and writing on our hearts his laws so that we know what they are and we obey them. We fulfill them, we follow them, we do them. We embrace them, they become part of our DNA that it spills out all over us through every pore. That's what he wants. Living in us so that we can live as him and for him. Get strength from and support from the Holy Spirit in our strength because he knows that we can't do it. He helps us remember because I easily forget these days. He helps us remember who we are, what our purpose is, and why we're here at all. And those things that once upon a time, the preachers that we hear at RBC and other places may have said to us, or the stuff that we read in the Bible day by day, or in our small groups, wherever it might be, he brings them to mind and said, in that situation, when you're wronged at work, when someone sets out to trip you up, whatever you do, when the rubber hits the road, you get a Christ-like response. Because that's what he wants. Because we want to stand out, don't we? We don't want to be assimilated. We don't want to be conformed to the pattern of this world anymore, Romans 12, 2, for any of you that know it. Here to make a difference, here to stand out, here to be different, here to show that there is a different way, a different possibility, a different outcome, a life to come, a kingdom that can be lived now and in the future. But we're here. That's what he wants from us in our bodies while we follow. One of the only times that I'm aware of that God ever says that he forgets or doesn't remember is in the next phrase, verse 17 of the passage that I've just read. I'm going to remember your sins and your misdeeds no more. How many of us still carry with us day by day I wish I'd never done in the shame of the past and feel that somehow we have to get forgiven all over again or we can never be the people God wants us to be because we can't flourish until that thing's gone and erased and wiped from our, our conscience and our memory. And yet the Holy Spirit, who is God speaking to us today, would say to you, I remember 
your sins and your misdeeds no more. If you are a follower of Jesus this morning and you have a clean heart and a pure conscience, you are clean and you are clear and you are free to move forward in obedience and flourishing as he intended you to be. It does not need to get in the way anymore, nor should it. And in fact, it's just ever so slightly dishonouring, however hard that might be for you to, to take on board this morning, if you keep it and you hold it. Because he's forgiven it, and he's forgotten it. In fact, the only thing I can think of that he ever says he's going to forget, by the way, and remember no more. It's not on the slate anymore. It's gone. It gives us inner strength to help us to imitate him to live the lives worthy of the calling that we've received, to fulfill the good works that he prepared in advance in the body that we've got in Christ Jesus. Given us those things. And if we need something else, by the way, look around. We might need inspiration. We might, do you know what? Who else has ever been down this path before? Whoever else has walked the walk of trying to be obedient all their whole Christian life? Well, the Bible's full of such people. Hebrews, if we read on into chapter 11, gives a great long list of them. And chapter 12 and 13 encourages us to remember the leaders that we have. How many of you can remember good leaders in your Christian life? Ministers here, youth leaders elsewhere, parents, grandparents, family members, friends, other people that you look to. Well, if you need some inspiration, look at them, look at their life. How have they conducted their life and what was the outcome of their faith and their obedience? What difference did it make? Did it bear fruit, yes or no? Be thankful for those people because God put them in your life to inspire you along with the inner strength that he has given you to enable you to imitate him and be an imitator of Jesus in the life and the body that you've been given. Because God has given them to you. So I asked this morning in closing, you'll be pleased that it's a really short sermon for me today because we're carrying, we're carrying in a lot of stuff in this service this morning, all right? And I'm going to be even shorter than Barry expected, so we're going to be finished well before 12. How exciting is that for everybody? Hooray, he's short for once. It's just age, by the way. I'm nearly getting there, don't worry. Jesus had a body. Hands up here if you've been given a body. Yeah, there's no one here who can't put their hand up to that, right? You might not want to because you don't want to play ball with me, but you have been, because I can see you, all right? Hands up if you've been given a body. By the way, hands up if you've been given an ear. Yep, well, most of you have because most of you responded and heard what I said. I used to be a sales trainer many, many moons ago. I'm too old for that these days. But once upon a time, I was a sales trainer. And one of the things we used to tell salespeople was this, you were born with two of these and one of those. One of them is capable of shutting, two of them never do. Jesus had an ear for God's word and he had a body for God's work. You have a body and you have ears, as do I. And my question for you this morning is, do you have an ear for God's word? And is your body surrendered for God's work? Because that is the obedience that is after. And even if you don't have a specific call on your life that says, I'm going to be a minister. There's enough in the Old Testament and New Testament for us all to be getting on with. Because you see, for every one of us, there's temptation out there. Walking the talk is not always easy. Forgive your enemies. How many of us find it easy to bless the enemy that set up or stood against us, whether they're my neighbour or my work colleague? How many people can't let go of something where they were wronged a few years back? How many of us still feel the tug in our purse strings of generosity and find it hard to let go? How many of us still find it the allure of sexual attraction elsewhere outside the marriages that we're capable and should be committed to? You see, every day we bump into stuff where the talk and the walk need to go hand in hand. 
And the obedience needs to come out when the rubber hits the road when we're faced with. Do I come with a Christ-like decision or not? God's will for Jesus' life was that you would be reconciled to him through the life that Jesus lived and the death that he died. And all of us would be drawn near. Our job is to carry on being his body as individuals collectively living out a life of obedience that makes attractive the words that we speak by the, word, by the deeds that we do. And we draw all people in. God wants everybody to have peace with him on the planet. And he wants to reach those people through you and me and to live lives that are different and dedicated to him and wholehearted for him and obedient to him in every sphere. We sung it. We said it this morning. Here I am. My life surrendered now. My life laid down. I give you everything. Did you sing those words? How many of you sang those words? Most of you. How many of you read, your will be done, not mine? Most of you, if not all of you. Let's take those words and the talking to walk this afternoon and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and everything that we do and make sure that we have an ear for God's word this week and a body surrendered for his work. I'm going to close now in prayer. It's actually a prayer lifted straight from the Bible, you'll be pleased to know, so I'm not varying from Scripture in any way. I'm going to read to you two verses of, chap- of chapter 13 of Hebrews. And I'll read it, and I'm sort of ad libbing to give the band time to come down, whoever's ready to come and play to us so that you're ready. But let me read to you, and hopefully it'll be on the screen. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. It's a prayer for you, it's a prayer for me. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything that you need, everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for challenging us in God's word and encouraging us as well. What a wonderful thought that uh, God remembers our sins uh, no more. What an amazing, liberating thought and truth. It's not just a thought, is it? It's truth. But the challenge of obedience, of course, is there too. Why don't we stand if we're able and let's sing in Christ alone together.
Would you please take your seats? You know, one of the themes we've been thinking about this morning is, is family, and uh, particularly off the back of our dedication service earlier on. And uh, at communion, we often uh, invite uh, new folk who have been welcomed in to the life of our fellowship to become a member here uh, with us. And today, that's uh, Jasmine Vine. So Jasmine, uh, let me come up to you for a moment. And I just want to read to you a verse, Jasmine, uh, from Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 6. So it says this. So being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. But I wanted to read it again, but insert your name, if that's okay, Jasmine. So being confident of this, that he who began a good work in Jasmine will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let me give you the right hand of fellowship and welcome into church membership. Let's just uh, pray for Jasmine. Lord, we give you thanks uh, for Jasmine. Lord, we thank you for her, her life. We thank you, God, that you knew her before you uh, even created uh, this world, Lord. And I just really pray your blessing on her life. I pray that verse over her, Lord, that she would know that you're continuing to work in her life. God, may she be confident of that, that you promise to never leave her and never forsake her. Lord, we thank you for her. We thank you for the opportunity to welcome her into church membership today. Lord, help us to be a blessing to her. And may she be a blessing to us, Lord, as we journey together uh, in this life of faith. We thank you, Lord, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we come to our time of uh, communion together. And in a moment, uh, John's going to pray for us as we break bread. But just want you to reflect, really, on the, on the words we've heard from Hebrews uh, this morning. And this is a love feast. It's a demonstration of God's love for us. You know, the blood of Jesus, the body of Jesus broken for us. You know, how often do we, do we doubt God's commitment to us because we feel unworthy or we feel ashamed or we feel guilty or, or we've drifted? Or, but this is proof. This is evidence. God loves you. Jesus loves you and he died for you. So in this next moment uh, together, just let's hone in again on this feast. Jesus wanted us to remember, because we're forgetful, aren't we? But we want to remember Jesus' forgiveness, his grace and his goodness in his life. So if you want to bring repentance here, bring repentance. If you want to bring thanksgiving, bring thanksgiving. But do know that it is a fact, truth, that God loves you in Christ. Thank you, John. Uh, let us pray we've been um, singing um, today about the, the goodness of God and uh, nowhere is that more demonstrated to us than in this meal we're about to enjoy together there's a line in that song that says um, you know, the goodness of God is, is running after me and I'm conscious that maybe uh, for some of us this morning it, it doesn't feel like that perhaps we are hurting perhaps we are feeling alone abandoned betrayed uh, maybe our bodies are feeling like they're a little bit broken well again this this meal reminds us that Jesus is familiar with that we can come to him this morning uh, knowing that he uh, knows how we feel he was broken. I'm reminded of those words in Isaiah, um, chapter 53. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised 
and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took, up, he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We've spoken a little bit and heard Brian tell us a little bit this morning about obedience and we are so thankful uh, that Jesus, you were obedient to your father, even to the point of death, experiencing all of these things for us, that we might have the assurance of an inheritance with you, that we might be adopted into your family, that we might be called uh, sons of God that that is what we are we are so loved by you and this this table this meal this demonstrates it to us in a in such a profound way so we thank you this morning uh, for the reminder of your goodness to us and of your obedience to your father we worship you this morning we praise you this morning. We thank you this morning for your great love for us and your sacrifice for us. Amen. So the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. Uh, that's been given for you. He says, do this whenever you eat of it in remembrance of me. So if you're a follower of Christ this morning, uh, why not take the bread and eat and be thankful as you receive it. Thank you, deacons.
we uh, pray for uh, the wine. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you uh, for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you have shed your blood for us. What Hebrews reminds us that we can be confident uh, to enter your presence, to receive mercy, and to find grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, as we come today, help us to experience that forgiveness, not just in our head, uh, but in our hearts, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the same way, after supper, uh, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. This time I invite, uh, I invite you to retain the cup. And at the end, we're going to drink together as a sign of God's our unity as a family of God. Thank you, deacons.
pause for a moment and just reflect on areas in our lives where we just need the mercy and the grace of God. Just give you a few moments before we drink together. This is the blood of Jesus shed for us. Let's drink and be thankful. We've been thinking about the mercy and the grace of God, so I thought it would be good for us to finish our service uh, with our final song, which is Your Grace Finds Me. So let's stand if we're able. And let's worship God together.
in whatever situation we find ourselves in, in whatever relationship we find ourselves in. May your grace be sufficient for us, Lord. Lord, your undeserved riches. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats. Just to say that our service has come to an end now. Thank you for for coming. Uh, This morning, just as a reminder, we have our evening worship uh, this evening, so please do come along uh, and we serve coffees and teas will be served uh, from six o'clock. And a reminder, please pray your, pray your, pray your blessing on Arian and Aaron uh, in the coming days and weeks and months, and of course for Alan and Joan as well. But as we close our service, why don't we say the grace to one another. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.